Hello, and welcome to this monthly movie roundup. My name is Ada, and these are the new releases I'll be reviewing for the month of February 2024. The purpose of these videos is to provide recommendations, so I won't be getting too deep into any plot details beyond what could be inferred from the trailer or the description, and I'll be using a three-tiered rating system for each film to let you know if I think it's worth your time. Yes, no, or the ever-helpful maybe. Let's get into it. First up, we have The Taste of Things, directed by Tron An Hung, director of The Scent of Green Papaya and Norwegian Wood. This movie came out on February 9th and stars Juliette Binoche and Benoit Magimel. The IMDb description reads as follows. The story of Eugenie, an esteemed cook, and Odon, the fine gourmet who she has been working for over the last 20 years. Let's start with the good. Juliette Binoche is great. Shocker. Her character Eugenie frequently uses that typically feminine tactic of managing the mood of a situation by responding with laughter and smiles instead of words when speaking honestly would mean telling someone something they do not care to hear. And the way that she does that really does give off the impression that this woman has had a lifetime of experience managing upward, as they say, in order to maintain some agency for herself in a world that does not make that easy for women. The set and the lighting are beautiful as well. Obviously, a lot of this takes place in the kitchen. I have no idea if the appliances and cookware are accurate to the time period, but for someone who doesn't know better, everything looks authentic. Uh, the sets feel realistic and lived in, even the more opulent ones, but unfortunately, it's hard to get a second to appreciate that because the camera is zooming around at a million miles a minute for most of the movie. Which brings us to the bat. In the opening scene in this film, Eugenie is cooking an elaborate meal for Dodon and his guests, and the perspective you get from the camera is sort of that of a very fast eight-year-old with vertigo who's been instructed to follow the movement of all pots and pans, but not film them for more than two seconds at a time. You're not necessarily getting the chef's perspective or a great view of the cooking process. It's not like Food Network cinematography. It's more just like a very energetic observer peeping over countertops and into pots and running around frantically. After a few minutes of this, it's like, okay, we get it, you're trying to communicate how fast-paced and labor-intensive cooking is. A little gimmicky, but surely this won't last the whole film. But it does, more or less. They tone it down for the final act, which I incidentally found tolerable, but for the most part, even for the scenes that are out of doors, the camera movement is pretty erratic, which is a shame because it looks very nice out there. So visually, you've got the perspective of a child after partaking in a fine 2009 vintage of Four Loco, and then orally, AU, it's like a thousand little road mics were scattered in a hundred foot radius across the set to capture every sound, the clanging of utensils on pans directly in front of you, the crackling of the fire five feet away, and the chirping of a bird 30 feet outside all at an equally high volume that meets or exceeds that of the dialogue. I imagine the phrase immersive experience might have been thrown around during production, but as someone who does cook often, I would say this is not representative of that experience because people don't like their countertops. They were selected with some noises though, while they kept in a lot of the breathing in the eating scenes, they were careful to exclude any mouth noises, saliva movement, chewing, swallowing, juicy stuff like that. I'm guessing they figured if they had kept in the little noises at the volume of everything else, people would have just been vomiting in the theater. So as an audience member, I appreciated that, but part of me kind of wishes they had committed to the bit just for continuity. But overall, I really got the sense that the director did not trust the audience to stay invested in two and a half hours of cooking, eating, and mostly one-sided flirtation, and thus resorted to this kind of gimmicky stuff to keep people engaged or make it feel fresh and modern or something. And to be fair, yeah, it is pretty boring. But it's boring with the gimmicks too, that wasn't the solution. But I also don't think it needs more plot or action or exposition. Story-wise, there's plenty to work with here already. There's just a lot of missed opportunities for depth that could have been met by chilling out a bit. Like, what could have been communicated about Eugenie's power and her relationship to her work by just stepping back a little and allowing us a minute to observe the way she moves around the kitchen, her pace, her decision-making, how she communicates verbally or non-verbally to the two girls that help out, how she anticipates the things that they might mess up without instruction, or on the opposite end, a shot of Eugenie at the end of the day, alone in her room. And I don't mean her looking at some photo or letter from the past, like I said, we don't need more exposition, but just an uninterrupted view of the change in her demeanor, her expression, her movement when she no longer has to perform for others, 
including Dodan, don't shove him in here, we do have shots like that already. There was just a lot of time to make these characters feel like whole real people that wasn't utilized super well, so it's a little difficult to feel invested in what happens to them or in their relationship to one another. That aspect of the film is more a story that you're being told than one that you're inside of. Um, Eugenie doesn't let Dodan in and the director doesn't let us in. We just get chaotic camera work and a cacophony of cookware, so this one is a no for me, but here, I've got props. If you like that, you might like this movie. More like the sound of things, am I right? I know I could get hate for this one. I've seen the phrase tour de force used in the comments for the trailer, so people like this movie, or at least think that they should. And that's great if you liked it. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you got something out of it. I'm just sharing my silly little opinion. If you have different stuff to say about this movie, you should make a little video about it too. It's kind of fun. All right, moving on. Next up, we have Out of Darkness, directed by Andrew Cumming. This is his first feature-length film. This one also came out on the 9th of February and stars Sophia Oakley-Green and Chukumodu. Here's the IMDb description. In the Stone Age, a disparate gang of early humans band together in search of a new land, but when they suspect a malevolent mystical being is hunting them down, the clan are forced to confront a danger they never envisioned. So, I don't really have a ton to say for this one. When I saw the trailer for it, I was like, oh cool, Paleolithic Horror. Might be kind of fun. And it was kind of fun. Nothing mind-blowing. This movie just grazes the surface of dynamics within a small community, in this case a tribe, different roles, expectations, and privileges of insiders versus outsiders and of different genders. You also get a little glimpse of the vigilance and determination needed to survive in a situation where you're not necessarily on the top of the food chain, but it doesn't really go too deep into any of those things or do anything new with them other than putting them in this prehistoric context. Obviously, having a small, isolated group battling a common threat is a pretty familiar format for horror movies. For the whole movie, the actors are speaking a made-up language, which is apparently a mix of Arabic and Basque. It's a cool detail, and I thought they all pulled it off and made it sound natural, which is impressive, but everyone looked way too clean for me to believe that this was 43,000 BC. I did like the ending. I'm not gonna give it away, I'll just say I liked it. But overall, I think if you're already into horror and you appreciate movies like Barbarian, It Follows, The Witch, that try to do something a little different than just the typical haunted house or slasher type of thing, then you might enjoy this. But I'm not saying it's as good as any of those examples, and I don't think there's quite enough depth or innovation here to recommend it for someone who's not already pretty into horror and who seeks out new horror movies on a regular basis. So I'm a maybe on this one. It was mildly enjoyable and I'm interested to see what this director does next, but I probably wouldn't go in for a rewatch anytime soon. Next up, Monolith. This movie is directed by Matt Vesley. Uh, this is also his feature-length debut. This movie was released first in Australia, but just had its US release on February 16th in both theaters and VOD, so this is the only one I viewed at home. It stars Lily Sullivan, and IMDb describes it as follows. A headstrong journalist's investigative podcast uncovers a strange artifact, an alien conspiracy, and the lies at the heart of her own story. Since this is the first feature-length film for this director, I didn't really have any expectations going in, and I was pleasantly surprised. Right from the beginning, it's hard not to be reminded of the Panny, the Rona, whatever you want to call her. For the whole movie, we're following one journalist alone in her parents' house, remotely investigating some sort of mysterious phenomena. And this was filmed in, like, May of 2022, so this quarantine-like setup would have been both convenient from a budgetary standpoint, but obviously safer. But I don't think this film is limited to being just some sort of COVID allegory. It gets into questions that would be relevant in many contexts, and does so gradually and organically as the plot unfolds. Given the main character's job, there's some focus on journalistic ethics throughout the course of her investigation. At first, mostly in the sense of how you handle sources, uh, how do you make people comfortable enough to give you information they don't actually want to share, can you use a little deception to that end, and then to what degree can you edit their information for public consumption? What constitutes editing for clarity versus for dramatic effect, and is it okay to cross that line sometimes? And then as she gets deeper into the investigation, you see her fighting to maintain credibility and honor her professional commitment to truth-telling. It becomes increasingly difficult for her to walk this fine line of being perceived as credible while trying to get to the bottom of a story that might be hard for people to believe, kind of like being in a doctor's office in the US when you know you probably need an MRI, but imaging is expensive, so you have to describe things in this perfect manner that signals that there is one identifiable thing wrong with you because too much information will get you dismissed outright. 
At one point, the possibility that the truth itself could be harmful to the public comes up, which puts our main character in an interesting position, and definitely reminded me of the beginning of the pandemic, when there seemed to be some hesitancy from public institutions around releasing information, maybe partially out of fear that it could cause a panic, lead to hoarding, price gouging, etc. So we get to see her commitment to truth-telling tested by that, as well as by the possibility that the truth may not paint her in the best light personally. So there's just a lot going on in this movie, and I think it's all dealt with pretty thoughtfully. That being said, it's not perfect. What is? The lead actress, Lily Sullivan, is great, but the voice acting from some of the sources feels pretty rehearsed at times. Depending on how you interpret certain things, that might be intentional, but either way, it's distracting. And my other gripe is just with the podcast logistics. The main character is releasing episodes about her investigation into this mysterious phenomenon just on the fly before knowing how anything will turn out, which seems unrealistic to me because it would be really hard to build a narrative without knowing how things are going to conclude. Maybe that's how these things are done sometimes. I have no idea. I've never worked in investigative journalism. I just thought it was a little goofy. But overall, I would recommend this movie. That's why I'm being pretty big on plot details, because this is a mystery and I think it's worth seeing. It's a little scary at points, but I think it would still be okay for people who don't particularly like horror but can handle thrillers that have little to no gore or jump scares. Most of the spookiness comes from the unknown or what isn't on the screen than anything that's actually shown. But yeah, I'm excited to see what this director does next, and that's it for Monolith. Next we have Bill Capitano, directed by Matteo Garone, director of Gamora, Dogman, and more recently Pinocchio. This film premiered on the 23rd of February and stars Seydou Sar and Mustafa Fall. IMDb describes this movie as a Homeric fairy tale that tells the adventurous journey of two young boys, Seydou and Musa, who leave Dakar, the capital of Senegal, to reach Europe. So right off the bat, if you've been exposed to any news over the last decade about migration from Africa to Europe, you know we're going to be dealing with some pretty heavy subject matter. Sometimes with movies that do that, I get a sense of trust just after the first few scenes that the director is going to bring the appropriate level of nuance and empathy and dignity to this story, and I can just lay back and let it wash over me. I think the most recent example I have of this was Memory, directed by Michelle Franco, which I would recommend if you haven't seen, trigger warnings for everything. But more often with movies that take on serious topics, I find that that trust is not there, and I feel a little on edge the whole time, like being in the car of a driver who you don't have much faith in. And unfortunately, that's how Yo Capitano went for me. In the beginning, we meet Seydou and Musa, two teen boys who seem to live a more or less pleasant life in Senegal, but want to go to Europe for better economic opportunities, specifically to make it big in the music industry. More on that later. At the start of their journey, the vibes are overtly fun road trip with my bro, which I found unsettling because obviously this is not going to be a fun road trip, so it does feel a little bit like this movie is delighting in the fact that it's going to pull the rug out from underneath us. Early on, we also get the first of several little sprinkles of generic mysticism which pop up throughout the movie and are never integrated well and are not necessary, so my expectations were lowered pretty quickly. As the boys are kind of passed through a web of groups that profit from migrant trafficking and they fall into increasingly dangerous and exploitative situations, it becomes pretty clear that this movie is just a basic hero's journey story, Seydou being our hero, that uses African migration to Europe as a backdrop that could be switched out for anything, not a story about African migration to Europe. The dangers that Seydou faces are things that migrants could encounter, but in this movie they just function as a series of villains or trials for Seydou to overcome for his personal growth. There isn't much effort made to illustrate the relationship between traffickers and local authorities, both of which pose a threat to our hero, or to shed light on the international conditions funneling all these people through this dangerous journey and motivating others to continue attempting it, knowing how perilous it can be. While we only ever get Seydou's story, we see mothers of young children, pregnant mothers, also walking across the desert, packed into cars and boats, and they're only ever utilized to showcase the empathy of our main character. We don't learn anything about them, so we certainly never know what the stakes of migration are for them. We can assume they're quite high or they wouldn't be doing this, but there's no attempt made to acknowledge that. We get the tiniest bit of backstory on one other guy that Seydou meets, but all we learn is just that he has a family, including a son that's Seydou's age. We don't know why he left them, was he not able to provide for them, does corruption in his hometown preclude the possibility of gainful employment through legal means. I'm not asking to be bogged down with clumsy exposition or unnecessary sob stories, but 
Since this film chose to take its context from real life, a nod to reality beyond the experience of our singular hero would be nice. And I do want to talk about the violence for a second because there's a lot in this film, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing in and of itself, but anytime you are relying heavily on images of pain and violence, especially that are meant to depict real, current, or historical events, I think it's important to think about why you need to show that and how you're doing so in a way that does something more than just contribute to either directionless feelings of rage and frustration or a sense of numbness or helplessness that comes with living in a society saturated with images of pain and violence. So if you're not interested in engaging with the real life context that you chose on a level that would allow for that kind of consideration, why not just go with different subject matter for your hero's journey story? You might be thinking I'm being super nitpicky or like, hey, representation matters, let's not discourage it. And yeah, maybe that's fair. I guess my questions on that point would be, one, is representation in and of itself exclusively a positive thing, or can it be executed poorly enough to be detrimental? And two, is it really representation if this is the director and these are the writers? But yeah, if you want to do your hero's journey movie, go off. My problem lies in the fact that this film uses a real-life setting, but if you try to take a real-life message from the film, based on all of the suffering that were shown and the lack of effort to examine the forces behind it, the only message that you can really take is migration bad. And I'm not saying that was the intention, but it's something that should have been thought about a little deeper. That being said, there are good things about this movie. It's very pretty, especially the scenes in Senegal at the beginning. The main actor is great, he feels like a real 16 year old boy, possibly an unusually empathetic one, but that's more on the script than on the performance. And like I noted, this is a story that should be highlighted, but not just as a means of retelling the Odyssey. So overall, this one's a no for me. I forgot to mention that this film is up for an Academy Award for Best International Feature Film. Not the first time I've disagreed with the Academy, won't be the last, but I would note that it's up against a zone of interest, which if I had to put money in it, will probably win. And finally, we have Madam Web, directed by S.J. Clarkson, who typically directs TV. This one came out on February 14th and stars Dakota Johnson. The IMDb description is, Cassandra Webb is a New York metropolis paramedic who begins to demonstrate signs of clairvoyance. Forced to challenge revelations about her past, she needs to safeguard three young women from a deadly adversary who wants them destroyed. Okay, so I actually threw this one in here as a gag because I knew people were dunking on it and I was just gonna say like, it sucks, don't see it. But I paid $6.75 to see this at a matinee showing and honestly, I don't want my money back, I had a good time. Is it a bad movie? Yes. But it knows that and it embraces it. I haven't actually watched or read any of the discourse on this movie, so I'm sure others have already pointed this out, but it is self-aware. We start out in the Amazon with DJ's mom. I'm just going to call Dakota Johnson's character DJ because she doesn't seem like a Cassie and Sydney Sweeney is in this so that's just confusing. So we're with DJ's mom who's looking for spiders and a guy who's obviously the villain and the drama's at a level 10. Soap opera lines, soap opera delivery, soap opera action. I don't think you get there by accident or by taking yourself seriously. The villain himself is great, he's always barefoot, which is fun, and for some reason most of his lines are overdubbed and it's not subtle at all. I can't imagine how messed up the original audio had to be for them to do this for everything, but the delivery for the fixed version is giving knockoff Chuck Bass from Gossip Girl Season 2 Episode 12 featuring Nastia Lucan, so quite good. He also has an assistant slash slave, I guess. He threatens to kill her at some point, and that's treated as a normal thing within their work relationship, so maybe assistant is not the right title, but it's Shoshana, and she's not in the mainframe, she is the mainframe. She literally never gets up from this desk with like 20 monitors of high definition video feed from every camera in the city. The city meaning New York, because this is a superhero movie, so obviously DJ lives in New York, like in a green screen sense, where she's a paramedic, like in a Paw Patrol sense. When we first meet her, she's driving an ambulance pretty recklessly, and Miles Away by the Yaya Yaz is playing, which is your first of many signs that this is set in the early 2000s, which isn't really relevant at all, but the movie wants you to know that. Dakota Johnson is great in this. She makes a lot of interesting choices with her line delivery and facial expressions that make her character seem pretty fun. But then whenever she has a really dramatic line at a climactic moment, she delivers it in this flat, unbothered LA girl voice. Which works, it feels like she's making fun of herself, and I appreciate that. She also has a catchphrase. Let's try that again. Great. 
Of course, we get the obligatory looking at old photos scene, which is how she knows to go to Peru, which she does while under suspicion of kidnapping. Can't be seen in public, but can travel internationally. Okay. In Peru, she meets the spider guys. They're like Spider-Man, but not. And this is where I get my proof positive that this movie is laughing at itself. One of the spider guys says, When you take on the responsibility, great power will come. Which is clearly an inversion of the Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility line, but it's kind of like the manifesty version, like, just do it and then you'll be able to do it. So I guess our lesson is manifest, manifest, but also learn CPR, which is fine. There are way worse lessons to be derived from superhero movies, so I'm okay with this. What made this movie tolerable for me is that it understands, asks stupid questions, gets stupid answers. So it just doesn't bother to ask things like, how does this made-up superpower work, and how is it related to other IP? It doesn't have a need for continuity or the laws of physics or realistic technology. It's just here to go down the comic book movie trope checklist and have a fun silly time. And you know what? For $6.75, I'll take it. Evening prices? No, certainly not. So I'm actually a maybe on this one. Is it a good movie? No. Duh. Is it a good time? Yeah, kinda. Maybe I'll watch one of the videos on this movie now, because I don't totally understand all the hate for this in particular when there's so much bad stuff out there to choose from. I'm not super well versed on DC MCU things, but I can't imagine people actually go to those movies expecting, like, cinema. Uh, I think people just like a pylon and this was the chosen target for the month. And yeah, it's pretty corny. Anyway, that's it for now. See you next month. Bye!